Pranam from Shanti Kunj Haridwar, Deva Sanskriti Vishwavidyalaya, India. Let us start with the recitation of the Gayatri Mantra. Gayatri Mantra is one of the most uh, powerful, magnificent mantra of the Indian wisdom traditions, the Vedic scriptures of India, written long time ago. And it is addressing the deity, the power, the mother, that takes us to the righteous path. In this world where we all are taking birth in an embodied soul, we all have got two choices in the life. A choice that takes us to the path of righteousness, where in spite of uh, facing adversities, in spite of facing the challenges in the life, in spite of walking on an arduous and, and challenging and difficult path, the outcome is pure and divine. And there is also a path which seems like the easy one to take, which seems like a comfortable one to take. But at the end it gives us nothing but guilt, pain, suffering and anguish. And Gayatri Mantra is a mantra that helps one to take the path of refinement, embellishment, becoming a good, decent and uh, noble human being. So those of you who believe in taking that path, join us in chanting the Gayatri Mantra together. Om Bhur Bhuvah Swaha Tat Savetur Varenyam Bhargo Devasya Dhemahe Dheyo Pranams and welcome from Shanti Kunj Haridwar again. We started to discuss the second chapter of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, Sadhanapad, referring to the techniques that the medium level seekers and the beginners are supposed to take when walking on the path of yoga. So this chapter started with the technique for the medium level seekers called Kriya Yoga. Then Patanjali talked about the purpose of the Kriya Yoga that it helps in weakening the kleshas. Klesh, Tanu, Karnarthasya. Then he mentioned about the klesh because normally a question would come uh, that what are the kleshas. So he talked about the path that actually brings the kleshas in our life. Then, as the Kriya Yoga only weakens the Klesha, he also talked about the other techniques that helps to destroy them completely. Then he talked about the mechanism that underpins uh, Kleshas turning into Karma and then eventually leading to this cycle where we cannot liberate ourselves. We end up doing the umpteen number of Karma. There is no liberation from it. There is no salvation from it because the Purvakrit karma, the karma that we did before, they create the circumstances of today and in response we end up doing more karma. So it leads to ad infinitum. We continue doing more and more and more and more karma and always there is one or the other karma to, to be paid. So then there is no escape from this uh, fake reality that we are in. So Patanjali then mentions about techniques to destroy them completely. Then he talks about the process, how these karma are created. Then he talks about the reason why these kleshas, they give us the suffering. And talking about that and mentioning about that, he mentions that the conjunctions, the association, the relationship that we have created with the scene that surrounds us, drashya, is the reason for suffering to take place. So then he defines both of them, drishya, drishta, what is sanyog. And the reason for sanyog to occur, he says, is avidya. Tasya hetuho avidya. 
and he says that if we are able to conquer it, if we are able to win over the vidya, then we can cut the connection and that could lead to a permanent, final, absolute freedom that he calls as the hana and that would lead to kavalya, a state which is difficult to define but each of us can feel that in our heart. And the path to have the Han in the life, he says that is Viveka Khyati, Viveka Khyati, Aviplavo Hano Paya. That is the measure, that is the way, that is the process through which uh, Aviplavi Viveka Khyati, which means that a state where there could be no further disturbances inside can take place, that happens. So, this seems like the ultimate state, but not to Patanjali. He says, even at that state, when you have reached to that level of consciousness, when you are only aware of yourself, there are still seven different uh, stages to take. And that he called as the Tasya Saptadha Prantabhumi Pragya. At that ultimate state, still there are seven stages to conquer. Four of which are related to doing nothing. Whatever there was there to be done has already been done. That are called Geya Shunya, Heya Shunya, Prapya Prapta, Chikirsha Shunya. And then remaining three are Kritarthata of the Chitta, Gunalinata and Atmasthiti. They are related to the dissolution of the Chitta back to the Prakriti because it has done its purpose. It has showed us both paths. It has showed us the path of becoming involved, which is the bhoga. And it has also done its duty of liberating us. So now it is redundant. Now it is of no use. So it has to be gifted back to the prakriti and prakriti takes it back willingly. That is guna linata. It dissolves back into the prakriti, leaving the purush the immutable, the pure divine consciousness alone. And that state is the Atma Isthiti. How would you reach there? So then the last technique, Ashtanga Yoga, has been introduced. Then Patanjali says, Yogang Anushthanat, that if you do the practice of the Yogaanga, Ashtanga Yoga, then it does two things, Ashuddhikshaya Gyanadipte, it removes the impurities and impurities are nothing but the illusion that we are carrying, the illusion of becoming involved, that we are here as a doer rather than as a witness and observer. So that path of the removal of the impurity and unleashing, unveiling the divine light from inside Gyanadipte together is the Viveka Khyate comes the natural question, what is the path of the Ashtanga Yoga? What are the Ashtanga Yoga limbs? What are the limbs of, eight limbs of yoga? So, then Patanjali introduces them. He says, Yamaniyam, Asan Pranayam, Pratyahar, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi, Ashto, Angani. These eight, Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, Pratyahar, Tyahara, Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi are the eight limbs of yoga and message is simple and clear. Message is that treasure is inside, only key is lost and we are supposed to find the key because it is already illuminating inside but we have forgotten how to reach there. Showing the path to reach there is the path of Ashtanga Yoga. And first one is the Yama. In Yama, there are five Yamas, and he mentions them Ahinsa, Satya, Ste, Brahmacharya, Aparigraha, Yama. That Ahinsa, which is defined as the Paramo Dharma, it is the biggest Dharma possible. It is the ultimate one. That if you are able to conquer Ahinsa, if you are able to imbibe the qualities of the non-violence, then everything else is easily possible. Because the one who would have the values and virtues of ahinsa, non-violence, deep inside his personality, 
he would never speak uh, untruthful things. How can he speak? Because that would lead to hurting other person. So ahimsa is there. He would never take anything from other person because then aste would be there. And he would always living a life that a divine would live. Brahmachari would be there. And he would not believe into unnecessarily accumulating the things that he doesn't even need because that would lead to depriving others. And in the essence, the principle of the ahinsa is there. So Vyas gives a beautiful analogy that ahinsa is like the footprint of the elephant. If elephant's footprint is there in the wild, if you have seen it, then it covers all other footprints, deers and lions and tigers, everyone else's footprint is covered by the footprint of the elephant. So Vyas says that if you are able to have ahinsa in the life, nothing else is needed for you. You can then walk like an elephant in the forest. You have got all the yamas under your control. And then he says something most remarkable. He says, Jati, Desh, Samaya, Kala, Anavichinna, Sarvabhoma, Mahavratam. That these yamas are the Mahavrat, they are the greatest vows. They cannot be broken, they are non negotiable and they are universal in nature. There is no excuse for not doing them. Give it or take it. You want to accept it or you don't want to accept it, it has no regard. In the eyes of the Patanjali, they are supreme most important and cannot be substituted by anything else. So these are the Yamas. Then comes Niyamas. Niyam Unlike the Yamas, because if you look closely, if you see it very careful, with their careful eye, then you would find that Yamas are related to my relationship with the society. Non-violence I cannot do alone. I need somebody to have an experience of non-violence. Truthfulness, I need somebody to speak. Brahmacharya, I need a society to exhibit. I need other person either for a stay or for a, a parigrah, that depends upon my relationship with the society, with the world that surrounds me. So, yama are related to my relationship with the world around me. Now, niyamas are all related to inside me. Yam is for outside, niyamas are for inside. If you are supposed to ever get in confused and then you can clear it that all the yamas are related. They are there to channelize the energy so that rather than looking in that direction, we start to look in this direction. So that's why they start with everything that is related to me as a person. And they are Shaucha, Santosha, Tapaha. Swadhyay Ishwar Padendhanani Niyama. He says Niyams are Shaucha. We can call it cleanliness or we can call it sacredness or we can call it purification. Whichever way you want to call, the idea is the uh, outwardly and inwardly cleaning of the person from any kind of pollution that we may have attracted. Then comes the santosh, contentment. Then comes the tapa. Tapa, swadha, ishwar, pranidhan are the same as the Kriya Yoga. If you remember the first verse of this chapter, it is started with tapa, swadha, ishwar, pranidhanani, Kriya Yoga. So the last three niyams are the same as the Kriya Yoga. First comes the shaucha. And shaucha is very clear. Many people confuse it with the outwardly cleaning. No, it's both. If uh, you ever take part in a sacred ceremony in India that Gurudev popularized as Yajna to every single household of India, the first act we do is the Pavitri Karana. And in the Pavitri Karana, when we are doing the mantra, the mantra finishes by saying, Sabahaya Bhyantaraha Shuchihe. 
that we should have the purification, we should have the cleanliness, we should be devoid of impurities, we should be free from any kind of impurities, not only outside but also inside. Outside cleaning is okay, like you know we take shower every day, doesn't mean that our karms are purified. Our uh, cleanliness depends upon the purification of the karma. So the shauch here does not refer to the outwardly cleanliness only. It doesn't refer to taking a shower, getting the new clothes and keeping ourselves uh, like you know free from the physical uh, impurity. Hygiene should be there, health should be there, no doubt. But here the reference is also coming to the inward purification. Because outward purification alone is meaningless. Many people are so beautiful outside, but there is no, uh, there is lots of dirt inside. The personality is tainted. Even the outwardly appearance may look uh, attractive and, and shiny. So there is no point of having a shiny exterior, but a painful interior. It is important to have both of equal importance. There comes a very beautiful story of Swami Ramakrishna Paramahansa's life. Uh, he used to say that, you know, the purification is like cleaning the same uh, vessel that we use every day. So, cutleries that we use every day, he used to clean it every day. So, people said, oh, you haven't even used it since yesterday. Why are you cleaning it every day, even if you haven't used it? He said, it's same like, it reminds me of cleaning my mind every day. Even if we have done one sadhana, one puja, one anushthan, one tap, doesn't mean that we are not accumulating the further dirt in our life. We need to clean it every day. And Gurudev gave uh, such a beautiful analogy for it. He said that every day we should wake up with one single thought in our mind, har din naya janm, har raat nahi maat. We should wake up with an idea that this is the only day that's been gifted to us to live. And how would I like to live? So he said that divide your day into two major practices. One he called Atmabodh, second he called Tattabodh. And it includes Chintan and Manan. Chintan, say for example, he said that before you, before you, like you know, place your foot over the, over the, uh, like you know, Bhumi, over the land. Just before that, give yourself two or three minutes. And then do a self-analysis self-analysis that what do I want to do today and where have I reached, what kind of life I am living, what I am doing in my life, is this the path that I wanted to take, do I already have reached to the place where I wanted to reach, is my personality right, noble, kind, generous, compassionate, just do your honest introspection, Gurudev said, honest introspection and by you for yourself. And if you do that, Gurudev said, you will find two things. One, that you would find that there are some impurities that I have uh, collected, accumulated, which needs purification. Doing that is Atma Sudhara, self-purification. And if I feel at the same time that I am missing something, maybe I should have also developed myself in that manner. So developing that quality is Atma Vikas, self-development. And this practice alone, Gurudev said, that if we are doing it rigorously, regularly and with absolute devotion, then it itself ensures that you are full of shuchita, sacredness, shauj, the first niyam that Patanjali is talking about. So those of you who are listening can start with this very simple practice. If you are interested, we would be happy to send literature about it. But then, this is the very simple practice that anyone can do anywhere. You may be traveling, you may be up in the air, you will be in your flight, makes no difference. You just need two or three minutes with yourself to do an honest introspection. That is the only practice needed to do internal cleaning. And he says, Patanjali, first is Shaucha, second is Santosh, contentment. Having a desire, not to accumulate anything beyond the immediate need. Whatever I need is already with me. Getting anything more than that is lust. 
if my needs can be fulfilled with what I have and I am contented with it, then this is Santosh. Acharya Shankar, there comes some good question and answer format from uh, Shankaracharya, where disciples are asking the questions in one line and he is giving the answer in one line also. So somebody asked the question that what is the biggest reason for happiness in the world? And Shankaracharya responds, Santosh, contentment. If somebody has got contentment, he would be contented no matter where he is and what he is doing. There is an interesting story of a very uh, rich man in India. So he, once night, you know, he had so much money that uh, like he is a billionaire. And one night he woke up with a very bad dream according to him. So wife said, what happened? He said, I saw a very bad dream. What did you see? He said, I saw that after seven generations, all my money has been gone. Like, you know, and it, even if my children would do nothing and they literally only have to take the, like, you know, the interest of the uh, wealth that I have created. He said, they would have money till seven generations, but after that they would have nothing. They would be penniless. He said, I am worried about them. What would happen in the eighth generation? So wife laughed. Wife said, okay, come to the guru. They had a guru. He said, let's go and speak with him and let him give us the direction. So they went to his place. And before they entered, they heard a discussion between guru and his disciple. Disciple had brought some raw vegetables to him, said, Gurudev, like, you know, today, uh, we got some extra vegetables because all the vegetables like you know we needed we have used them and now there are some left what should we do with them he said oh uh, donate them donate them to the like you know needy ones so disciple said and what would we do tomorrow so he said who planned for today <laughs> we never planned for today and we shouldn't worry about tomorrow he said whatever comes tomorrow we have got enough for today why should we worry about tomorrow he said, leave it to the divine, he will make the arrangement tomorrow. That wealthy man who came there to seek the answer got his answer. That, you know, if you are contented, you could be contented in what you have. You don't have to search and run for anything more. It's just there. First thing is shauj, which is outer and inner purification. Removing all the pollutants of our life. And that would mean getting free from the physical impurities, mental impurities, social impurities. If we have attracted the wrong kind of people around us who only give us nothing but the dread, pain and guilt in our life, removing them. Clean yourself from every possible angle. Physical, mental, emotional, social, every reason. And then comes the contentment, santosh. Then comes the tap. Although we already discussed tap in the first verse, but tap, idea of the tap is to happily embrace all the challenges and conflicts that would appear in my life. There is a saying in Sanskrit, and it says, sorrow is the hammer of God. That when we get the Adversities in our life, they are there to refine us. In Mahabharat, when the war has ended, then everyone is asking for a blessing from Lord Krishna. So, and Lord Krishna was granting it to everyone. So, then uh, came also Kunti. Kunti was the mother of Pandavas. And she had the most challenging life. She was the queen, but she still had to spend all her life in the forest. All her children, the elder one actually got separated and he fought from the opposite army. The five children that she had, they all like, you know, almost close to dying and then had very difficult and painful and challenging life she had. So Lord Krishna asked that, what do you want, Kunti? And she said, uh, do you want any sampatti? Do you want any prosperity? And she said, no, I want pain in my life. Krishna says, Lord Krishna said, why? He said, if there is pain in the life, then there is always a possibility of refinement. Pain is tapa. 
it helps us to constantly purify ourselves. It helps us to refine our personality. And then she said a Sanskrit word. She said, Sampado na Sampada, Vipado na Vipada. There is prosperity, appears like prosperity, it's not. It just like, you know, make, makes you big headed. And challenges appear like challenges, but they are not. The real challenge, she said, is Vipati Narayan Vrismriti, that if we forget the divine path and Sampati Vismarana Vishnu. That if we are able to remember the divine, if we are able to remember our path in the life, that's the real reason for happiness. So that's it. Following that path, even if it appears challenging, is the path of tap. And you see any great enlightened being, they may have had the most difficult circumstances in life, but their mindset was always calm, contented, balanced and happy and poised. Look, anywhere. Did Jesus Christ not had difficult life? Like he had the most difficult life. He had to, the way he had to sacrifice himself was the most challenging, painful one. Saint Augustine, Saint Francis the Assisi, Kabir, Gurudev, Vivekananda, they all had such difficult lives. Such difficult lives, circumstances were painful, but their mindset was always calm, contented, balanced and poised, always radiating light, bliss and happiness to all around. That is the path of Tapa. Then comes Swadhyay. Swadhyay is Moksha Shastra Dhyanam. Reading anything that leads us to the path of salvation. Even if you are reading something but with an intent to get the wrong understanding, then it is of no use. It is only of use when our intent to read it is to take us to the path of liberation. There comes a very interesting story. A story is of a saint. He was giving a lecture. And he started to give the lecture. He said, uh, in the night one should. And he said this much. And suddenly he had a heart attack. He died. Now all the people who were in the audience, they were returning home. And they were thinking, what he possibly could have said, like, you know, he just finished half of the sentence, but what he possibly could have said. And there was a thief in the audience. He thought he must be saying in the middle of the night, we should steal. That's the best time to steal. Then there was also a black marketeer, a person like, you know, who was uh, using wrong means to do the business. He said, maybe he was saying that we should do all the business, like, you know, wrong kinds of business in the middle of the night. That's the best time to do it. Then there was also a yogi. He said, oh, he must be saying that in the middle of the night, we should do the meditation. That's when the distraction is the minimum and also concentration could be easy. So, the story is the same. We interpret the messages as we want it to be interpreted. And same is with the reading the scriptures. He says, Patanjali says, Moksha Shastra Dhyanam. Read anything, but as long as your eye is on the goal of liberation, goal of salvation, then it would start to make sense. And then last is Ishwar Pradhan in the Niyamas. And Ishwar Pradhan they say, Sarva Karma Param Guru Arpadam. Whatever you do, devote it, offer it to the greatest Guru and the greatest Guru is only one, which is the Divine. So, Shauch Santosh Tapah Swadhyay Ishwar Pradhanani Niyama. These are the Niyam. And the purpose of the Niyam is to turn your direction inward. Yamas are there for outwardly life, for my social life so that I can start to learn to channelize my energy in this direction. And now, it is there to balance the energy so that it could be used for a constructive purpose. These are the Niyamas. Then comes another very beautiful saying from Patanjali and very important one also. He says, Vitark badhane pratipaksh bhavanam If you are being harassed, by the vitarka, by the 
wrong kind of thoughts, pratipaksh bhavanam, then focus your mind on the opposite end of it. And it's not only for yogis, it is a solution for everyone. It is a solution for a student, it's a solution for a common man, it's a solution for a citizen, solution for a doctor, it's a solution for an engineer, it's a solution for an accountant, solution for every possible human being. He says that if you are being harassed by a particular type of thought, and what does it mean, vitarka badhane? Badha means obstruction. All those thoughts which appear to be the obstruction in the path of the yoga. And these kind of thought, thoughts, tarka, referring to the thoughts, we means like, you know, the bad kinds of. And uh, he says that if we, our mind is attacked by them, if we are under attack from negative, pessimistic, wrong kinds of thoughts, think opposite. Pratipaksha bhavanam. Pratipaksha means counter. Counter thoughts, you should bring an army of the counter thoughts to counter them. And this is so important and so beautiful at the same time. He says that the reason it is important, what does it mean? It means that this path is not easy. Everyone is going to be attacked by the negative thoughts. Otherwise, there was no reason for Patanjali to bring them soon after discussing Yam and Niyam. They are there. That's why if you Remember the story of Nachiketa that I mentioned in the chapter 1. When Nachiketa meets Yama and asks about the spirituality, then Yama says, Kshurasya dhara nishita duratya durgam pathastat kavyo vadanti. This path of spirituality is like walking on the edge of knife. It's like so sharp that kavyo vadanti, even big rishis are afraid of walking on it because a small mistake and you will cut yourself. It's like walking on the edge of knife. That's what he says. And same here. He says that it would be there, but then counter it with the absolutely opposite thoughts. And Vyas gives a beautiful analogy. He says that if your mind is surrounded by like, you know, lustful and all these kind of thoughts and you get the anger, for example, bring the compassion. If you are getting envy, bring a feeling of Prayer for that person. Let him flourish. Let him do good in his life. Just bring the opposite. He says it's not easy. It's not easy, but you are supposed to get it with the equal determination. And the analogy Vyas uses is even much more stronger. He says that if you are ever like, you know, uh, surrounded by the lustful thoughts, think like, you know, I have become like a dog. I was walking on the path of the yoga and what had happened to me? He says, think like, is this the thing that I really want? Is this the path that I really want to take in my life? Is this the thing that would lead me to another millions of years of bondage and now I have committed myself to a path of yoga? Then why should I even think about these things? He said, bring the opposite thoughts with such a strong intensity that the other kind of thoughts cannot sustain them. They cannot hold their ground over there. I, if you remember in the third or fourth verse, when we were talking about uh, Avidya and Asmita, I mentioned the story of uh, a rishi called Saubhri, uh, who was the one actually who wrote the Devya Tharva Shirsha also. His name is there in many Vedic suktas. And he was in a state of... Uh, Samadhi for a long period of time and in spite of that he deteriorated, he declined and then when he declined, what did he say? He says, Aho paschat imam me vinashah tapasvinah sat charitra vatasya. He said, look at me. How did I destroy my tapasya? What had happened to me? I was such a tapasvi, I was such a sat charitra vat. I was following such a strong and arduous and and like, you know, life full of uh, spiritual qualities. What did I do to myself? And we should think the same. He says, think about the consequences. If you are doing it, you can only stop your thoughts to turn into action if you think about the consequences. That is, oh, fine, let's do it. But then, where it would lead to? And Pratipaksha Bhavanam, he says, that kind of counter thought is the way to to challenge it because these are habits of many, many, many lifetimes. 
and something that has taken like you know millions of years to develop they cannot go in like one second just because we agree with them does not mean that we have got developed the sankalp and commitment to win over them we need to do it again and again baram bar as we say in, in sanskrit and then he even defines the vitarka uh, this like you know the pratipaksha bhavana even more he says what you should think not only he is not giving the blank ideas that okay fine like you know if somebody comes to me and he says that i am feeling very angry and i said oh don't <laughs> then makes no sense like you know fine he also knows that he shouldn't be angry he is asking for the proper solution and patanjali is giving a proper solution he is saying in detail think like this what that's the next works verse he says vitarka hinsade if you are surrounded by the negative thoughts like you know a very violent kind of thoughts for example he says and you can use the same analogy in any other condition he says vitark hinsadaya if you are surrounded by these kind of thoughts then think what krit karit anmodita lobh moh krodh purvaka mridu madh adhimatra dukh agyan anant phala iti pratipaksha bhavanam think what think this he says that think that these thoughts are not only dependent upon me they are dependent upon krit karit anmodit which means that i am not only creating a karma that i am creating karma could be created by three means krit karit an anmodit krit means that i did them karit means i asked somebody else to do them anmodit it happened and i was silently consenting for them to happen there is a beautiful story that comes in mahabharat but let me explain this first krit is like i go and stab someone i am responsible for it like in the court of the law i would be held accountable for it culpable for it and i would be punished for it but then if i hired assassin to do it then also i would be held accountable not to the level of like you know the uh, murder but also gross demeanor i would be held accountable man slaughter i would be held accountable but if a murder was taken in front, in front of me and i did nothing i was just silently observing it i may still be held accountable for it that's what patanjali is saying that we are not only doing the karma that we are doing it if we ask somebody else to do it and if we become silent observer for it we are held accountable for it in mahabharat that the story that i was referring to bhishma pitamah is one of the most respected like you know the personality when he decided to die he said okay i will choose the time when the sun would take a particular path we just actually had it few days ago so that particular path he was waiting for it to take and then only he wanted to leave his body so he like you know um, he said okay i will wait but then death came to take him so bhishpitama said that how can you come to take me i have committed no like you know karma that i am responsible for it and you have to wait so death said to lord krishna that is he right he said no no he has done a karma so bhishpitama said what karma did i do he said the karma that you did is that when draupadi Uh, that say uh, who was the queen of pandavas and she was mistreated in the court room of the kauravas that time you were there and although you did not do it you did not ask anyone to do it but you were an observer for it to happen and you did nothing so your silent consent your silent approval was there which became a karma and now you are responsible for it so patanjali says that whenever we get the opposite kind of thoughts think like this that we are responsible for these karma and these karms can also be created by three means lobh krodh moh it could be created out of lust it could be created out of anger it could be created out of attachment so another combination is there they they could there take place then mridu madh adhimatra they could be depending upon their intensity 
they could be small in intensity like you know somebody comes and i said of oh, i just became slightly irritated then i became very angry that is madhya and then adhimatra i became violent i became aggressive i am running after to kill him all three are the same intensities are different i become irritable that's mridu i become angry that is madhya and i become aggressive i become violent i become brutal that is adhimatra technically all are krodh technically all are anger but depending upon the gradation they are different and the higher the grade worst kind of karma you are supposed to fin- uh, face and then he says dukh agyan ananta phala they lead to suffering they lead to endless karma endless because they each have got the combination like even with intensity if mridu lobh is there and krit karma is there it itself has got 27 combination if you go for the permutation it leads to infinite infinite combinations are there so infinite results are there so just think whenever you are attacked by the opposite kind of thoughts that what a kind of legacy i am creating for myself where i am trading what kind of path this would lead to i am creating endless series of the consequences of karma for myself he says like you know that remember this iti pratipaksh bhavanam this is how the counter thoughts are created without having an understanding that what kind of serious problem we are creating for ourselves just by making a small mistake now this would not be possible to hold to our positive thoughts so patanjali talks about five nimas shauch santosh tap swadhyay shupradhan then he says that vitark badhane pratipaksh bhavanam that to counter the thoughts bring the opposite kind of thoughts and then he defines that whatever the combinations are there krit karit and modit is there lobh moh krodh purvak is there midu madhya adhimatra are there and then other like uh, they lead to dukh agyan and anant phala this is the pratipaksha bhavanam so we finish it here today and uh, thanks for patiently listening tomorrow we will go to the outcomes of following the path of yam and niyam shanti path together Om Deo Shante Ranta Hariksha Gwam Shante He Pretha Veh Shante Rapa Shante Roshadaya Shante He Vanaspataya Shantir Vishwe देवः शांतिर ब्रह्मा शांते हे सर्वग्वम शांते हे शांते रे व शांते हे सामा शांते रे धे ओम शांते हे शांते हे शांते हे सर्वारिष्ट सुशातिर हमारे YouTube चैनल शांति कुंज वीडियो गायत्री परिवार को सब्सक्राइब करें एवं बेल आइकन जरूर दबाएं ताकि गायत्री परिवार की विभिन्न गतिविधियों की जानकारी आपको मिलती रहे